three. Sit around a campfire atop a sand dune, a grizzled farmer and his young sons. They're in a grove of ghost trees, trees which reemerge from shifting sand as pale spikes spiraling to a point. Soon the sun will set on the horizon of the lake, which some call an inland sea. The farmer drinks from a bottle of cider and passes it to his teenage son, who drinks and passes it to his younger brother. He spits out the bubbly, boozy beverage, and the old man and teen laugh at the boy. The farmer grabs his back in pain, and the brothers reach out to him. He points upward. Dark clouds slink across the sky. He drinks the cider and motions for the boys to come near. Years ago in winter, I was on my way to an ice fishing shanty on Lime Lake. The moon shone through the pines, casting shadows across my path. Sounds of ice pinged beneath me as I walked. I headed toward the glowing window of the shanty. I looked over my shoulder and nothing. I kept walking to the window. The sound again. I turned around. The shadow of a wolf-like creature crept along the ice. The moon behind it as it overshadowed me. I took to run, but slipped on the ice. The shadow receded. And ever since, whenever a storm comes and the pressure drops, my back pain returns. Lake effect can trigger rapid fluctuations in the barometric pressure. Griping about the pressure is a pastime of the people. Some days, the whole town feels it. Teachers will tell you that on such days, the students are sluggish. In the stores, people will complain about vertigo, tight sinuses, ears that want to pop. Dark clouds continue to roll across the sky. The farmer grabs his back again. Lightning strikes. The farmer and his sons turn to face it and see a black horse-drawn carriage. The carriage rolls along the path through the sand dunes until it stops beside them. The driver, a young mute with light skin and obsidian hair, motions toward the carriage's window, which opens to reveal a face crowned with a black top hat. The owner of the face pulls out a map and signals for the farmer to approach. Is this the way to Mender's Bay? It's a queer old map of the area, hand-drawn on parchment paper. Yes, you're headed the right way. The window shuts, and the carriage moves on. It rolls through the forest, trampling stray wildflowers. Continuing down the apple orchards and nearing the town. Clouds continue to approach. The carriage stops in front of Dog Man Tavern. The tavern's mustachioed owner steps outside and pulls out a cigar cutter from his pocket. The carriage door opens and the stranger steps out. He tips his hat to the proprietor and looks to the stable house next to the tavern where a sign hangs that posts lodgings. Is it vacant? The proprietor lights his cigar. 
He nods to the stranger. The stranger hands him money and enters the stable house. The mute racks up the horses in the stable and joins his master in the upstairs apartment. Inside the tavern, the atmosphere is lively. Patrons dance to a familiar tune. They drink fizzy cider, bathe in the light of a lantern. The proprietor, now behind the bar, polishing glasses, glances at a barometer on the wall. It shows the pressure is dropping. A drunk man comes in holding large pieces of hair. The music stops and the patrons go to the windows. Balls of hail are falling from the sky, crushing everything. The storm devastates the apple orchards. hall meeting is held. Rowdy farmers and merchants jostle to speak. At the back of the hall stand the town's undertaker. His Native American wife. And their beautiful daughter whose features are dark like her mother's. The doddering old mare tries to placate the desperate farmers in the crowd who hold baskets full of destroyed apples. Gentlemen, gentlemen, please. A creak is heard. The 
heavy door to the town hall opens, and the stranger and the mute enter. The crowd turns to look at them. Handsome boy, thinks the girl. She and the mute make eye contact. The stranger holds up a scroll tied with a ribbon. It's his plan. Another major hailstorm is imminent. Mark my words. I can save what's left of your crop if you'll let me. The crowd murmurs. He continues. This plan in my hand belongs exclusively to the first man to bring me one coin. A single coin of any value. As for the execution of the plan and the pricing, we can discuss that at a later time. He removes his hat, revealing a mane of hair, gold as the silk of heaven's spiders. Ladies and gentlemen, fate is a fantasy, destiny a delusion. Everything can be solved, nothing can't be overcome. The undertaker's wife glares at him. Yes, everything can be solved, besides death, weather, and quackery. Some in the crowd applaud, but one apple farmer, the grizzled one with back pain, hobbles toward the stranger and offers a coin. Yet it's worth more than her haughtiness. She didn't lose anything in the storm. On the contrary, if we all wind up poor and starve to death, she'll sell more coffins. I'd like to see what you're selling, stranger. The stranger nods and takes the coin. As he departs with the farmer and the mute, all eyes are on them. As the mayor tries to regain the crowd's attention, the undertaker's daughter sneaks out through the heavy door that had been left slightly open. The stranger, the grizzled farmer, and the handsome mute sit at a lantern-lit booth in Dogman Tavern. The stranger unrolls his scroll. His drawing depicts a grotesque apple orchard. The trees encased with thick wire mesh Those poor trees. They look like frightened statues. I've heard of nets to protect from the hail, but not this. Nets won't stop what's coming. Your trees need armor. I have the materials for it in my crates. How do you know what's coming? The stranger replies. If I divulge my methods, then you'd be sitting on this side of the table. The question is, do you trust me? No. So you'll provide the materials. I'll provide the labor. 
and I'll pay you fairly after the next hailstorm comes and my apples are spotless.
At the Apple Orchards Wednesday morning, work on the project begins. The workers carry pocket barometers to keep track of the pressure. The farmer and sons, the stranger, the mute, and many hired helpers are encasing the trees with sturdy wire mesh. As they labor, they drink cider from a barrel that was brought up from the farm's cider cellar. Each of the town's farms features such a cellar. Dug into a mound of turf, a cave sealed with a small wooden door. The wire is unrolled out of crates. Crates which the stranger brought to town. He furiously scolds the farmer's young son for weaving strands of wire into the shape of a spider web. No art to do. Create things on your own time. The town drunk intervenes. Stay away from the little one, stranger. The workers encase all the trees of the orchard in wire. At first, they thought it was a tornado, but 
It was just the winds racing across the water, furious, obliterating many forests, sparing others. The mute climbs the solemn trail and meets his love at an overlook. They gaze at each other near the summit. They flirt by drawing together in the girl's notebook. They pass the notebook, drawing one at a time, adding bit by bit. First, the dunes. Then, some ghost trees and flowers. Then, the two of them sitting on a bench. And then, the mute shows her what he's just drawn. It's the dog man's shadow looming over them. They collapse into laughter and kiss. Realizing that his daughter has not returned home, the undertaker goes out in search of her. The undertaker's wife knits a red shawl in her house by the light of a lantern. She glances at the clock on the wall. It's midnight. She keeps an eye on the door and she waits for her daughter and husband. Mounted above the fireplace in her living room is an impressive headdress made from a coyote pelt. She looks at the ornate barometer on the wall. The pressure is dropping. She grabs. 
grabs her jaw in pain. There's tapping on the ceiling. Hell. Undertaker walks in, escorting his ashamed daughter by the hand. In his other hand, he holds a giant piece of hair.
all of the town's orchards have been rendered near barren by the second storm. All except for the grizzled farmers. Though devastated by the first storm, his orchard still boasts many apples. The grotesque mesh worked. He pays the stranger fairly as promised. to keep the wire up for now. It can be adjusted as the branches grow. A town hall meeting is held. The undertaker and his family once again stand in the back of the hall. The old mayor displays nicely produced charts, which convey that fur trading is up, and dairy production is up. A ruined apple hits his podium. The trapper throws a skunk pelt at the fur chart. A bottle of milk slams against the milk chart. Do something. My cousin is an apple farmer. At least the stranger had an idea and it worked. Gentlemen, gentlemen, please. A creak is heard. The heavy door to the town hall opens and in comes the stranger, the mute, and the grizzled farmer. The stranger carries a basket full of perfect apples and gifts it to the plump milkmaid. The stranger now presents many scrolls. He removes his hat, revealing hair as gold as the silk of heaven's spiders. Was I wrong? Is fate not a fantasy? Destiny not a delusion? Cannot everything be solved and overcome? Bring me your problems. the stranger and desires his services. to the townspeople. Gadgets illustrated on indecipherable scrolls. These 
gadgets come from the stranger's seemingly bottomless hidden crates. He goes door to door. The trapper buys a ridiculously convoluted new trap, triggered by springs and gears. The dairy farmer buys a gadget for milking cows, operated by a foot pump. The tavern's proprietor buys a miniature guillotine for beheading cigars. It's supposed to improve the taste. something, he shakes hands with the customer, and each time, after the shaking of hands, the mute seems to experience discomfort, sinus pain, dizziness, ears that want to pop. The concerned customer rushes to his side. By way of explanation, the stranger points to the sky. Lake effect clouds are regularly rolling by. Or he points to a jittery barometer. It's the pressure. And each time after the stranger and you leave the customer's residence, the customer feels a sudden discomfort as well. A pain in the knee or the back or a vague nausea. Do you feel that? Must be weather coming.
beautiful girl peers over her mother's shoulder. Spontaneously, the mute grabs the girl by the hand, and they run. The undertaker's wife tries to pursue, but is paralyzed in the street by a terrible pain in her jaw. She falls. Her husband rushes to cradle her. Dark clouds are moving fast across the sky. Inside the tavern, the provider waits for patrons to arrive, knowing that many will come tonight looking to alleviate their symptoms. Patrons begin to file in and order cider. They sit in anguish, hoping to find solace in their bubbly beverages. The proprietor polishes glasses and eyes the barometer. It's going wild. The clouds keep racing over the empty street of the town until the evening sky clears. But when it clears and the sky is full of piercing stars, the tavern barometer falls to the floor and shatters. Everyone in the tavern experiences excruciating pain and stumbles out into the street, clutching each other and looking up at the sky. The distressed crowd envelops the mute and the undertaker's daughter before they can reach the stable house. Meanwhile, horses break free from their stables and run toward the crowd. Amid the chaos, the daughter sees her mother cradling her mother in the street and jerks away from the mute to join her parents. The daughter can hear in the crowd shouting, let's find the stranger, he'll have a plan.
emergency town hall meeting is held. It's the third meeting since the stranger arrived. The mayor addresses the townspeople who are visibly in pain or discomfort from the gravely low pressure. Even the mayor himself is showing the symptoms. He now walks with a cane. The undertaker turns to his wife, who is seated in the back with her daughter. The wife has a white cloth wrapped around her head. She's not immune. The mayor unveils a chart. It displays weather patterns, temperatures, and forecasts. No one pays attention. They're sighing and groaning. The stranger enters the town hall, appearing not to be in any discomfort whatsoever. He holds a black scroll tied with a ribbon. He parades it down the aisle toward the mayor's podium. I can solve the problem if you'll let me. One coin of any value buys you this scroll. But the coin must come from you, Mayor. Anything to get us back to normal. The stranger takes the coin and unrolls the black scroll for the mayor. A deranged laughter echoes through the town hall. It's the legendary town drunk older than Moses. He'd never previously been known to attend a town hall meeting, but there he is, crouched in the corner, grinning. All set aside their afflictions for a moment and listen. to the grizzled farmer with the two sons. The younger son tries to stop the mute from going into the cellar. Go away! He kicks the mute in the shin. The mute wavers and even feels the pressure for a moment. The stranger's face contorts in anger and for an instant, deep wrinkles appear on his visage as if he had aged a lifetime. I made you from nothing. You're nothing unless I say otherwise. Go inside. The mute enters the cellar with the dynamite. The dynamite 
installed inside the various cellars is connected by a vast network of cables. Cables from the strangers' crates, which lead to a single detonator on the street. Distressed townspeople, moat and groan, gathered around the detonator. The afternoon sun burns bright and clear. The stranger approaches the detonator and removes his hat, exposing that golden hair. All of your problems are about to be solved. You're about to experience relief, the truest pleasure. I couldn't. He's interrupted by the undertaker's wife. She steps out from the crowd, head wrapped in cloth compresses, and positions herself over the detonator. She begins to accuse the townspeople. I don't know what's happening, but I know we're responsible. And then, suddenly, she pushes down the handle.
hillside, foam falls from bubbles burst through the doors of the cider cellars, and cider streams down the hill toward the town. Millions of bubbles rise up into the sky, and with each burst of a bubble, a townsperson experiences relief. The effervescence seems to be repressurizing the air. Headaches, backaches, and lameness fade among the crowd gathered outside the town hall. All is well, better than well. The mayor tosses away his cane and declares the evening a holiday. A festive, even orgiastic atmosphere takes hold. Teachers dance with students, dogs yip and howl. The tavern's mustachio proprietor unclenches his arthritic fingers and lights a cigar for the first time in days. The undertaker's wife removes the cloth that had been tied around her head. She attempts to take her daughter by the arm and lead her home. But the daughter pulls away, eager to join in the festivities and reunite with the mute. The undertaker persuades his reluctant wife to leave with him. It's time to go home. Let them be. Let them have some fun. The town frolics. The sight from the exploded cellars flows down the hill and begins to flood the town square. People dance in the cider at their feet as the level of the bubbly beverage steadily rises and soon covers their ankles. They drink with hands and mouths from the cider surrounding them. The trapper tickles the milkmaid, and the mayor grows the plump dairy farmer. The undertaker's daughter and the mute find each other in the crowd and kiss. Of course, the stranger is nowhere to be found. The grizzled farmer, with a mischievous look in his eye, whispers something to his sons. The brothers scamper up the hill to their wiring farm. The people are now knee deep in the cider. Those who can play music scrounge together instruments and perform on the street for the crowd of revelers. The mute breaks from his lover to retrieve his fiddle and joins the ensemble. She's never heard him play before. People dance and dance as though under a spell, splashing in the almost waist deep cider. A humongous shadow slinks across the landscape and creeps toward the revelers dancing in the cider. Someone notices the monster on the hill and screams. Everyone turns and stares in terror at the figure. A stampede ensues. A frenzy. Townspeople run in every direction to escape the monster. Horses have broken free from the stable house and gallop into the crowd, thrashing about and trampling the villagers. The people claw at each other to escape, pushing one another out of the way and stepping over the bodies that fall face down in the waist of cider. It all happens in a matter of minutes. The only figures who remain are Dogman and the mute who stands trembling. Dogman throws his shoddily stitched costume to the ground and reveals himself to be the farmer's son, the younger brother sitting on the older's shoulders. They're in shock, panicked by their joke gone wrong, and they sprint back home. The mute wades through the bodies. He discovers the grizzled farmer floating face down and discovers the legendary town drunk floating face up, his face frozen in a grin. And then the mute discovers the corpse of the undertaker's daughter.
The mute carries the girl in his arms to the doorstep of the undertaker's house, sets her down, knocks on the door, and leaves. The undertaker opens the door and shakes his head. He collapses on his dead daughter. His wife, upon seeing the daughter, screams for an instant, then slowly walks back inside to the living room. She lights the two candles on the mantelpiece of the fireplace, above which is mounted the coyote headdress. She puts on her native shawl and she prays to the headdress. somewhere else to be. They lock eyes. The mute wanders away. Louse. Barnacle. Do you comprehend your decision? The mute pauses and keeps walking back toward the town, away from the stranger. The stranger climbs up and takes the reins himself. He cuts through the path, leaving the town, past the wire-encased orchard, and enters the forest, trampling stray wildflowers. He picks up speed as he approaches the dune. Weird noises stalk his carriage. His horses seem nervous. He looks over his shoulder, puts on his hat, and prompts the horses to go faster, higher, faster toward the dunes. Dogman shadow flickers across the trees. Faster, higher, faster, higher, faster, higher, faster, higher. The frantic carriage loses balance at the dune summit. It tumbles down the steep wall of the dune and lands on the shore of the inland sea. The stranger lies motionless in the sand. He isn't dead. He comes to in time to see a pack of coyotes dripping down the dune face toward him, lit by moonlight. 